Welcome to Loving Christ, connecting God's Word to God's people one verse at a time. If you were to ask random people on the street if they thought they were going to heaven when they died and why, most of them would say yes because they think they're good people. Many false religions around the world teach that if you live a good life, you will go to whatever they consider to be heaven in the afterlife. However, the Bible teaches something completely different. In this new midweek series entitled Assurance, Being Certain of Your Salvation, Dr. Keith Zachary will teach us, using the Bible, how we can all be absolutely certain we will spend eternity with God in heaven. And here's a spoiler alert, it has nothing to do with whether or not we think we're good people. Now let's open our Bibles and prepare our hearts to receive the Word of God. And now, here's Dr. Zachary. Last week we we're looking at the subject of the assurance of our salvation, how may we know we are saved. And we had conversations, so we had people from the congregation speaking to uh, the congregation in answer to questions we were asking. And thus this microphone obviously is out this direction, though I don't know how much interaction we'll have tonight. But if we're recording it and we want to try to hear what's being said, that's why this microphone, I guess, is pointed to you. However, you'll probably have to speak a little louder than normal in order for it to be heard. But I don't know that we're going to have too much interaction. You're always free at any time while I'm speaking on Wednesday night to raise your hand, ask a question, uh, make a comment if you like. It's just a more casual environment, uh, just teaching. And so you feel free to speak up. Romans. Chapter 10 is where we were, and uh, we're coming back there. And I've given you a few things for us to consider uh, in this series. We're going to look at tonight the necessity of Scripture in defining salvation and revealing the way of salvation. So if you want to know that you are saved, uh, you want to know you are saved, you would need to... uh, Know what the scripture says about salvation. What does it mean to be saved? And you need to know what the Bible tells us as to the process of becoming uh, a believer or being saved. Next week, we'll talk about the testimony of the apostles in salvation, how they describe salvation and using some of their wording to help us look at it in a different way. Maybe you can see it in different ways. Salvation is reconciliation. Salvation is regeneration. Salvation is these different words would be used synonymous. Uh, Jesus uh, answered a question that was asked, what must I do that I may inherit eternal life? That was a question that was asked. And I think uh, he was talking about salvation, but just listen to the terms that we will be using uh, Inherit eternal life was the question that the rich young ruler asked. How may I inherit eternal life? That could be a phrase that could be defining or describing salvation. And Jesus told him certain things that he needed to do. If, if doing was what he was asking, uh, how, how may, what must I do? Jesus said, well, if it's, we're going to answer that question, deeds have already been prescribed. And he went down the list. And he said, I've done these from my youth. And he said, well, there's one more thing that you must do. And then after the the man, the rich young ruler, would not do those things, he left. And this is what Jesus said. It's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. Maybe that's another word that, or phrase we would use. Uh, how may I inherit eternal life? Uh, Uh, It's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. And even the disciples picked up on that and said, who then can be saved, which is the term we're driving at, knowing that we're saved, our assurance of salvation. So there are other terms that we will use and look at and and just try to look at salvation with those phrases or terms in mind. Uh, The third uh, lesson that we will look at is the nature of repentance, something that many times is is left out in uh, you must repent and believe. And so uh, the nature of repentance and the experience of the call to conversion, we'll talk about that. The fourth lesson will be uh, the understanding of the unity and fellowship in the body of Christ. If you want to know that you're saved, this is something we have to look at. 
as a vital evidence of God's grace in your life as a believer. And finally, we'll talk about the importance of faith, which we might would have thought would be at the very front, but we're putting it toward the end. The importance of faith in salvation and the life of faith following conversion. So that's the, where we're headed. So I hope you'll come for all of these. Just how may you know that you are saved? And these are evidences, biblical proofs, actually, is what we're talking about. The divine proofs of salvation. So you come tonight. Uh, we're just going to read a verse to get started here in Romans, and then we'll be going on uh, other places as we try to cover just what's being said here. The term that we're focused on uh, tonight is, of course, the term saved. How do you know the how do you know you are saved? Let's just look at that as the term is used here uh, in our text. So uh, I'm reading uh, chapter 10, and just for to, be, to begin, uh, we'll begin verse 13. So let's pray together. Father, I realize that even reading the, the scripture tonight requires... Uh, my dependence upon you and for me to read it without dependence upon you would be wrong, would be sin. And so I acknowledge at the very outset I'm dependent upon you even to convey through reading your word, just reading it. Father, I know it'll stay on the page and not, not minister to anyone's heart if I'm depending upon my ability to just read or speak. And so I'm depending totally upon you, Father, to make your word come alive to all of us tonight. So bless me even in reading the scripture. May we see it with eyes, fresh eyes, and hear it with hearts fully uh, opened by your spirit. And may we receive what you have for us that we may truly be blessed with the assurance of our salvation. Thank you, Father, for hearing uh, our prayers. We humbly pray and pray in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 13, and I know there are other verses that precede that. It's kind of hard to start, start in the middle of any chapter without going back, and so we will make a few comments, but let's look at verse 13 and forward. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord, here's the word, shall be saved. There it is, shall be saved, okay? So we know that being saved is calling on the Lord, or calling on the name of the Lord. But then let's continue to read verse 14. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So you have to believe and call on the name of the Lord. And how shall they believe on him in whom they've not heard? So you have to hear and believe and call. Let's put all this together. And how shall they hear without a preacher? So someone has to preach to you a message, the message, the gospel. You have to hear it, not just with these ears, because many people heard Jesus teach and preach, but they, didn't, they did not all hear him. Blessed are your ears, he said, for you hear. And so they have this miracle of being able to hear and understand what's being said and have it personally applied to their life. They hear, not they just hear, but they hear it is for themselves. They hear it for themselves. And so when you hear for yourself, then you can believe because it, it's going to give it. We're going to find the answer to it here in just a moment. Uh, but let's just read on. So let's and then I'll come back and make that clear. So how shall they hear, of course, unless there's a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, bring glad tidings of good, bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by the word of God. So the necessity of scripture are the word of God in order for you to know what salvation is in order for you to know also uh, the way to be saved once you know what salvation is. And all that comes by the hearing of the preaching, and then the hearing of the word of God. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
Now, I just want to show you, I said I would mention the verses preceding where we started. It's very important for you to see that. Look at verse 13 one more, once more, where it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay, And then we come into the importance of Scripture being presented to them so they can hear and so they can believe and so they can call. But look at what it says in the beginning of this particular chapter of Romans. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel, for Israel is that they might be saved. You see that? And, and then he says, there's a problem. Why aren't they saved? Of course, because there is something that they're focusing on that is the hindrance. It is basically they're stumbling over something. Let's just read it on, read on to it. And we'll come back to this. This will be our close, by the way. So I'm introducing the close at the beginning. Rather unusual, I understand. Let's just read these verses and look at them. Then we'll move forward. So I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about righteousness, which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. And that is the word of faith which we preach. You see the word? which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. Key point there, don't miss that word righteousness. It's very important when we're talking about salvation. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And there's no distinction, very important we bring this in, between Jew or Greek, for the Lord, the same Lord, over all is rich unto all who call upon him. And thus, back to our opening text, whoever calls. Now, I think we've made it clear already just by reading these verses that Scripture has to be in the in the. If you're going to have assurance, it has to be in the picture. You have to have scripture, a scriptural understanding of the message of salvation, a scriptural understanding as to the way to be saved. How are we saved? And I think it's very important that we understand that the scripture presents something of a negative and then a positive in the message that we must believe. The negative which is why we read the beginning of this chapter, we have to understand that there is a problem in our life, and that is we do not have righteousness. And that is required in order to have a relationship to ours. Righteousness in order to have a relationship with God. And this is what salvation is, having the righteousness in order to have a relationship with God. That's basically what he's saying at the front. I pray for Israel that they might be saved. But their ignorance of God's righteousness is one problem. And going about to establish their own righteousness is the second problem. They can't come to the solution, and that is the righteousness that is available through Christ. They don't know about the righteousness of God. They don't know that they they're ignorant of the fact that their right, their self-righteousness is not acceptable. And because of those two things, they are not coming to an awareness of the righteousness that is available. So when we talk about being saved, listen to me very carefully. It is being granted the righteousness that is required to have a relationship with God. Two things every person in this world are without when they come to this world. A relationship with God and the righteousness required to have that relationship. So we have to go in and preach the negative 
while the message that we are presenting to them is positive in one sense, in the, in the greatest sense, in that when they hear this, when they believe this, when they call out on Christ, call out to Christ after they've heard and believed, then their salvation, the righteousness is granted and it is a righteousness of faith. But first, the word of God has to be presented. The message we preach, he says, you know this already. It's the message we preach. And so here's what you should never think. You should never think that God is not coming to your rescue. He has already come down to your rescue. The question is not, why doesn't God do something? He's already done something, and the Word of God tells us what He does. And when Jesus came and He paid the price for our salvation, we're not waiting on Him to come out of the grave to prove that that is a finished process. It's over. He's already come out of the grave. You know that. So now we have some other things we have to preach. The righteousness is available. How do we have this righteousness? Of course, God sent his son, Jesus, this is the gospel, to bring us the righteousness. It is the righteousness through Christ that he brings us to the end of all of our attempts and efforts, the pursuit to uh, to, to, uh, have righteousness by our own works. That's over with because Christ has come to provide the righteousness. He paid the penalty for our sins. He resurrected to provide the righteousness when we believe and call on him. This is all right here. It's all it's all right. Here. And, you know, I, I know I'm preaching to people who already believe this. I think we already know this. But if you ever, if you ever put your attention elsewhere, as we said last week, for the assurance of your salvation, you can become very disillusioned. You can You can actually... You can actually begin to have great doubts about your salvation because salvation is something that God has offered by grace through faith. And you know that's true because God said it in his word, which is why the word is so essential. The the scripture is so essential to our salvation. We must know what the Bible says. And of course, Sunday we were talking about the Reformation And that's one of the things that we'll be talking about this Sunday, just for your information. We'll be talking about uh, sola scriptura, which is basically the essential that we need to get back to basics to the Bible, which they had abandoned. The church had abandoned. And Luther basically is saying, I've read the Bible and here's what we need to believe. And it's not what we are, but what we have been presenting to people. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Sunday. So we need the word of God. We need to hear the word of God. We need to continue to hear the word of God. We need to hear the gospel. We need to continue to preach the gospel to ourselves that this is the truth that I have believed and God cannot lie. And what God said is true. And my salvation is based upon the truth of God's word. And so when you take your eyes off scripture, then something else begins to happen. You begin to have questions and doubts. Am I saved because I feel saved? No, it's nice to feel saved, but I'm not saved because I feel saved. Am I saved because somebody told me? Well, don't worry about it. You're saved. I know you're saved. I I shouldn't have any confidence based upon their opinion of me. They can be all off as to what they think salvation is. I shouldn't hear that. So so what do I need? I need a confidence in what God said about what salvation is. And I need to believe that if I believe that, then I can't I can't doubt that God cannot lie. So I just want you to see that 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 salvation is uh, hearing the gospel, the good news, which preaches this. What salvation is uh, uh, by grace. Salvation is through faith. All that's interspersed in these scriptures, which we read it every It's by grace, it's through faith in Jesus Christ, who is the end of the law to grant us righteousness. And by that righteousness, we have a relationship with God. We are reconciled. Some of my favorite verses right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and you know I've come to it, where we preach reconciliation. It's the ministry we've been given. And how are you reconciled? 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for God made Jesus to be sin for us. Jesus, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 
So it's the righteousness granted that we might have the relationship with God. And that's according to Scripture. So we cannot ever abandon Scripture. It is a Scripture that tells us uh, we have life through Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. How would I know that if it weren't for the Scripture? It's a Scripture that tells me that I need Christ. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. How would I know that if it weren't for the Scripture? The Scripture is giving me the negative all over the place. And and when I read the Scripture and I see that I'm a sinner, then I'm ready to receive the good news of how can I be rescued from this problem? And when I read the good news, there's nothing you can do to be rescued. It's all been done for you through Jesus. Then that's the good news. And that's by grace. You didn't deserve it. You didn't work for it. You can't work for it. You didn't work to have it. You can't work to keep it. It's all by grace. And it's through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that's just basically what we say. But these things are given us. You know, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It is the truth of the gospel that brings us to the liberty that we have in our conversion. The truth of the gospel. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And beyond your salvation, the truth continues to provide all that is necessary for the ongoing process of your salvation. I have been saved, but I am being saved. It was the truth that brought me to salvation. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. When I was saved, Jesus Christ brought this liberty to me by granting me the righteousness for the reconciliation in my relationship with God. And I've been set free, therefore, from what? From sin. Bondage to sin. I'm free. I'm free from the penalty of sin. Death. I've been brought to life. But then there's an ongoing salvation in that I am being saved. And we call that sanctification. We've talked about that. So how am I sanctified? Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So it's an ongoing process. I heard the good news to believe to be saved. And I continue to hear the word of God to be sanctified. It is the word of God that continues to make me more like Christ. Am I assured of my salvation when I read the promise of God and I know I'm saved by the promise of God that I have believed and God, and we'll talk about this later, has called me to himself by allowing me to know that, understand that, reach out to him through those promises. Then I know that I have done just what God has given me to understand and to know I've actually live that scripture now. And now I know because the word is a part of my life and my experience, I'm saved. But then the same word continues to minister to me by the conviction of the spirit and make me more like Jesus, which is another way of my uh, having assurance of my salvation. It's in the word. It's in the word. So when you start having doubts, I don't feel saved. You don't think you have something somebody else has. You just go to the word of God. And if God said to you these things about salvation, you needed righteousness. It's available through Christ. You came to an awareness of that. The negative, I'm a sinner. The positive, here's the salvation through Jesus. And you have repented of your sins, which we'll come to, and called out to Christ. Guess what? Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Done. Isn't that something? So it's very important. Now, if if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, we have to keep preaching the word of God. So we have to keep preaching the word of God. We can't stop preaching the word of God. And here's the thing that I would like for you to see. If if you are saved and the conversion continues in you, the word of God becomes such a part of your life. It's not just something you read casually. It's something that that ministers to you and nourishes you to grow. So it becomes a a part of your life. Now, this is something that requires other people to help you with always. So now you're saved. It requires someone to help you with that by preaching to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then when you begin to grow after your salvation, here's a way that you can have the evidence. You continue, as I said, 
sanctification. You continue to become like Christ, but you need help. This is where we come into Jesus saying, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them. Keep the word in the picture. You can't take the word out of the picture. Teaching them what sort of things I've commanded you. And lo, I'm all with you always. So what do we do after people are saved? Somebody has to take that saved person and begin to help them to grow. Now, listen to me very carefully on this point. Once you're saved, the continued and continuation of your conversion, being saved, being saved from the power of sin. You've been saved from the penalty of sin by being brought to life, but now you need to be being saved from the power of sin in your life and becoming increasingly more like Jesus. You need help in that area. Uh, we don't have super saints in the family. None of us are super saints. Everyone needs help. It's very important for us to realize that. And at any time you think, I don't need help, you're in serious trouble. It's like the person drowning and people say, you need, you need this life preserver? And you say, no, no, I've got this. You're drowning. No, you need help. And that's what people need to understand. You need help. So to say, I don't need help, you're wrong. Everyone needs help. And this is where discipleship comes in. It's very important for us to understand in the continuation of our conversion. I need someone to encourage me. I need someone to instruct me. I need someone to help me. Now, you have to let people do this. Because if you're going to be discipled, you need to you need to meet with somebody that you think uh, has grown a little bit further down the road than you. They have a little bit more understanding of the word and you can see it in their life it's not just that you think it you can see it and so you have to let that person come into your life and be someone who can be blatantly honest with you and not many people want that to just tell you the truth and i would have you know that jesus traveled, we have his his model of discipling, his own disciples. He traveled with them and they traveled with him. Rather. And he was very honest with them about their problems. He spoke to them. And you need to hear it. I mean, you need to read the Gospels and just see how Jesus did it. But you need someone in your life, a, a person living what they're learning to help you learn what they're living. And that takes time and that takes honesty, just absolute honesty for someone to be able to say, I see this in your life and you need to grow up right here. What? I only tell you this because I love you. You need to grow up right here. And so I'm just encouraging you to understand That when you get someone in your life that can help you in this way, you need to let them be honest with you and tell you everything that they need to tell you. It's very important. Honesty in that bond and relationship is very important that they can show you what the word of God means for you and how you need to grow. It is also very important for you to both understand you're still growing. Meaning that. Both of you have flaws. Your disciple maker is not perfect. And he or she is learning as well. But you're learning what? You're learning the word of God, for it is a continuation of hearing, believing, praying in order to become more of what God wants you to be and to express what God has given you life in Christ. So that's. Very important. Now, let me just give you a a primary lesson for all disciples. This is primary. When you're saved, and I shouldn't have to say this to anyone. It should come natural. But in our day, I think we let a lot of people slide on this very important primary lesson. And that is when you are saved and you have this righteousness in Christ, You should share this righteousness with others. You should share this message with others. 
So we're, we're talking about discipling you being discipled, but one of the primary lessons that you learn is that it becomes your desire to see other people saved. This is Paul, same chapter, beginning. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. It's always a good indication that you're saved when you want other people to be saved. You begin to have his heart, the heart of Christ. You begin to desire to see people saved. And I think that's very important. Who do we desire to be saved? So much so that like Paul, it becomes a part of our prayer life regularly. As Paul says, regularly he is praying for Israel to be saved. And he knows their problem. It's not that he's distant from them, been there, done that. I know what that's like. Paul could say, look, let me tell you, I I know what it's like to to be a, a, a a Hebrew of Hebrews. I know what it's like to have the rituals in your history. I know what it's like to have a membership in a tribe. I know what it's like. And he could go right down the list and tell them, but that has not brought you to righteousness. So Paul has a bond with these people already. He, he knows what they're holding on to. He knows what they're stumbling over. And you have been saved and you know what people are stumbling over. You can give a personal testimony which opens their receptiveness to hearing the gospel when you say, I have been where you are. That's very important to be faithful with your testimony and let people know I have been where you are and I have knowledge of what you need. So I think one of the things that comes out rather clear is that once you're saved, you begin to desire, as Paul presents here, you begin to desire to see other people saved. And if you can't do anything at the beginning but pray, you at least begin to pray for people you know who are lost. You begin to pray individually for people to be saved, realizing that their ignorance is something that's their hindrance, and you're praying that God speak the word to their heart. Now, I'm going to kind of go down some things here that that I want you to see. Not only does Paul pray for these people, But I want you to see, as I say here, he knows what their problem is. But let me ask you this question. Now, Paul's praying for who in this passage of Scripture in chapter 10? He's praying for Israel. But he was called and sent to preach to who? The Gentiles. And so his heart's desire is for Israel to be saved, but his message and his ministry is to Gentiles. He's been sent to the Gentiles to preach the Gentiles. And this is very important because Paul stands as a testimony of people who have a heart for evangelism. So when you say, I'm praying for Jews, I'm preaching to Gentiles, you've covered, every, you've covered the world. That's everybody. You're either a Jew or a Gentile, and if he's praying for one and preaching the other, this is his heart. And it should be our heart as well. Uh, I'm going to quote a scripture for you, and if you know, you can tell me you know or raise your hand and say, I know I know where that's found. Sal- this, this is a scripture. Someone in the scripture says, salvation is of the Lord. Anybody know where that is? Okay. I have the advantage because I've already marked it in my Bible. You're not going to believe who said that and where that is. It's in the book of Jonah and the Old Testament. Jonah said it. You know why that's significant to our message tonight, where I am in our message at this point? It's because Jonah was called of God to go to Nineveh and preach to some people that he hoped God would judge. I don't even like these people. That's okay. You're going to go and preach to them. And Jonah had some other plans. I think not. 
And he determined to get in a boat and go as far in the opposite direction as he could go to get away from that responsibility and assignment to preach to people he didn't like. What happened to Jonah? (laughs) We all know God sent a ferocious wind. There's a big storm. The sailors on the boat are saying, who's God's causing all, who's God is causing all of this problem? Well, there's a guy down in the, in the boat asleep. We need to go wake him up. It's amazing that he could sleep in all of this. Bring him to the top. He said, yes, it's me. It's my, my God is the only God there is, by the way. And he's the one that's causing this because I'm going away from the call. What can we do about it? He said, well, you can throw me overboard. This is an amazing story. I love this story because it's not about a fish. It's about a prophet that doesn't want to obey God. And so they throw him overboard. You know what happens? The big fish comes up, swallows him. It's a calm sea. And those sailors now know the God who is God, and they're very fearful. And uh, that's where we leave them. But we find Jonah in the fish. And it is in the fish that he begins to cry out to God. And it is in the fish that he says, salvation is of the Lord. Let let me just read it to you. It's in Jonah chapter 2. So so he's going to get another chance here. He says, Verse 7, when my soul fainted within me, this is the end, I'm, I'm at the end, I'm going to die. I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And what does that mean? Now, if you're saved, God wants you to be concerned about people being saved. This is what I want you to hear. If you're saved, God wants you to be concerned about all people, even the people you may not like. Jonah. See, Jonah was a prophet. Let me just give you this part of the story. We're coming back to the New Testament. He was a prophet. The people that he's going to preach to Nineveh are not only people he doesn't like. They're people who have been really, really. Bad. I mean, in the sense that Nineveh, when they killed people, when they invaded places, they were vile. And uh, Jonah is saying, I do not want to be remembered as the preacher who preached to our enemy and they were saved. I don't, you're destroying my, my ministry, Lord. I mean, I don't want to be remembered as the person who saved our enemies. And as a matter of fact, he went preaching, telling them, look, You have three days, basically, you know, to to get right. I mean, rather, I'm sorry, 40 days. 40 days, a three-day journey there. He preached through the city. You have 40 days, and then it will be overthrown. And (laughs) Jonah set up a little camp outside of town because he wanted to see this. He wanted God to overthrow Nineveh. He wanted God to judge Nineveh, but he had a sneaky suspicion that if God wanted to judge them, he didn't need to go tell them they were about to be judged. God would have just judged them. So he kind of thought that, well, no, God's up to something here. Uh, and sure enough, Nineveh repented. They proclaimed the fast from the least to the greatest of them. Uh, the king even rose up and took off his garments, his robe, laid it aside, put on sackcloth and ashes and repented. And so God didn't judge them after 40 days. And guess where Jonah is? He's out there angry with God that he sent him to preach salvation to the enemy of his people. It's it's amazing that we read the book of Jonah and understand that God is a gracious God to Jonah, not just to Nineveh. Jonah's out there pouting. He's angry with God. He's saying, you might as well kill me. I don't have a ministry left. Nobody's going to want to hear me preach. I mean, it's God could have just taken his life, snuffed him out. But God was gracious to him. And not only gracious to him by not taking his life, God was gracious to him by allowing that fish experience to be the only sign that Jesus would give that he was the 
Messiah. I'm not going to give you any sign except the sign of the prophet Jonah. As he was in the belly of the fish three days, I'm going to be in the earth three days, and you're going to see me again. Hmm. How gracious God would use Jonah for such a significant sign. So the thing is, I'm getting off. You're going to get me off on to preach something else here in a minute if I don't get away back to the New Testament. What I'm trying to say is, when you are saved, salvation is God's business. And you need to remember that he expects his people to be about God's business. And he will put it in your heart to love all people. To love all people. And so how do you know you're saved? Well, God's word tells you you're saved. You took God at his word. You have his righteousness. You begin to live what you learn as you continue to learn the scripture and someone's discipling you. But God's going to put it in your heart to pray for other people to be saved. God's going to put it in your heart to pray for other people to be saved and even to participate in sharing the good news with people. And it may be people you don't even like. So knowing that Paul was preaching to the Gentiles, I promise you he's preaching to people that he grew up not liking at all. Just like Jonah went and preached to people he did not like at all. And it's time for us, if we really want to sense the joy of our salvation and have a greater assurance if you're suffering from lack of assurance, then start praying for people you have not liked at all. Pray for Nancy Pelosi. Well, I'm just saying that may be one. I don't know. Maybe it's not. Pray for Maxine Waters. Pray for people that you have complained about. Those people have a soul that's going to spend an eternity somewhere. Let's pray for them. And wouldn't it be just wonderful if God saved the whole bunch of them and they wouldn't need to be replaced in this next election? Can God do it? If he could save Nineveh, he could save the whole bunch of them up there on the Capitol Hill. Pray for them. Let it be known that that's our heart, that what you really need, what you don't understand, you need. You need the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to be made righteous. And we know that. And we're praying for you. If that's as far as it goes, then that's as far as it goes. But we are praying for you. Now, let me uh, show you something else back in the New Testament. Here we go back to the New Testament just for a moment. The word of God is important. Jonah had to go preach to Nineveh for them to be saved, preach to people he didn't like. Paul's praying for people he loves, but he's preaching to people that he grew up not liking. I mean, we just see a whole new, different attitude about life and people and souls, and that all comes home to us as an evidence of our salvation. We want people to come to know Christ, and we pray for them, and we preach to them. And many times God sends us, especially the people, We don't particularly want to go to, but that's who we go to. Turn back with me in the New Testament. Let me show you some other things that we find. I'm I'm sorry, in Acts, I was reading this Sunday. Here's another reason why we need the Word of God, not only to preach to people, to encourage us to pray for people, but we need the Word of God. These are evidences. These comfort us greatly when these things come about in our life. Also, we need the word of God to make certain that we don't have a repeat of what happened in 1517, October 31st. What happened? Church had gotten so far off track that there had to be a reformation and a call back to Scripture. Why? Because traditions had become more important than Scripture. And people had become more powerful than God had ever granted power to anyone. When one person could call the shots, as I said Sunday, we're in a bad situation. So here's what happens. Let me just show you in Acts chapter 15 because I want you to see it. I read it to you Sunday, but see it again. Acts 15. And certain men came down from Judea and taught brethren, the brethren, that unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, 
you cannot, do you see that? Be, what's the word, saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then here they're saying, no, unless you do this, you cannot be saved. Why do we need the word of God to prevent this kind of thing from happening? To prevent people from adding to Steps to, requirements to, salvation that aren't found in Scripture. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word, then what people are hearing and should be hearing is the Word. Not anything added to. And so the people here are saying, oh, by the way, salvation? Yeah, well, salvation cannot be your experience unless you do this. And they added this particular thing. Circumcision according to the custom of Moses. And of course, we have the Jerusalem Council, which is in this particular chapter. We talked about that Sunday. And we found that what was important was that the church came together and said, let me tell you, Peter and Paul both said, let me tell you what God's doing out there. He's saving people and they're not circumcised. We've never even mentioned circumcision and they're getting saved. Peter had a testimony in particular where he tells exactly what God did. God gave him this vision. He says it right here. You know, God had given him this vision. By his mouth, he was supposed to go and preach the gospel and tell them uh, the gospel. And when he did, Barnabas, I mean, uh, Cornelius and his household were saved. And what could he say? So he's saying, we haven't been told to tell anybody about anything about circumcision And so we have to say this is not what we're experiencing. And I said this to you Sunday, and it's very important. When we come to things that we're trying to figure out, what does God have to say about this and about that and the other thing? Just watch and look and see what God is doing in our world, because God's doing something with regard to our questions. So the question was, could could Gentiles be saved without becoming Jewish in some practices? Do they need to know the God who... Uh, is the God of Moses and what and what he required them to do in the Old Testament. Do they have to kind of step in line with that? Because I didn't explain this Sunday, but if you were a Jew living in this day, you would understand that the Gentiles could come so far into your faith, but that's as far as they could go. You go to the temple and there was a court of the Gentiles. You stay right here. You can't come any further. And he even had signs posted that if you stepped any further than this right here, you may very well be killed. You can't get any closer than this. This is where the Gentiles stay. And by the way, that's where they were selling animals for sacrifices. That's where they were changing your money for temple currency and all of that. And Jesus came in and when he clean, cleansed the temple, that's the area he cleansed because he said, my father's house will be a house of prayer and you've made it a den of thieves. You've let these people who don't know God as you know God not know the God you should know, basically. And he cleaned house. He did it more than once. So what am I saying about that? I'm saying that people want to put things in the way of individuals being saved, complicated by adding things to it and making it more difficult than it is by giving assignments that Well, here's what you have to do to be saved. Now, tonight and last week, I'm not telling you what you do to be saved. I'm showing you evidences of salvation, biblical or divine proofs of salvation. I'm not saying you do this to be saved. I'm saying because you are saved, you do this. It's just like Jesus said, he that endures to the end shall be saved. It's not that you endure to be saved. It's because you are saved, you endure. It's important to see that distinction. But when people come and tell you that the way to be saved is anything other than faith in Christ and his finished works, then we need to be very careful. And that may be why some people are questioning their salvation. They've heard some things that should never have been told. I've heard some crazy things. You've heard some crazy things. We could share some things that just not in the Bible. So... Just just be aware that that's out there. We are sitting in a building tonight that has a 
an, uh, uh, an associational and denominational affiliation. We're part of a group of churches. Those churches are Baptist churches. And we're part of the Southern Baptist denomination. Is that required to be saved? Absolutely not. Could any denomination claim that you have to be Pentecostal? You have to be, you have to be Methodist. You have to be. No, no denomination can claim that as a requirement for salvation. And if you've ever heard anyone say anything like that, they're absolutely wrong. And they're participating in what we find here, adding to the requirements for salvation. So if you've ever questioned it, you just need to go to the word and see that God said no. That's not what you do. It's just by grace through faith in Jesus who provided the means of your having his righteousness for a relationship. So when you have people adding to and saying you cannot be saved unless. And I remember years ago in my own experience, I remember going to hear certain preachers preach uh, when I was younger. And I remember them saying, and I said this last week, that if you don't know the day, the hour, the place where you were saved, then you're probably not saved. I can't tell you what happened last week sometime. Don't ask me what happened when I was seven. I can't remember the place, or maybe I can't remember. Maybe I can't remember. I can remember the place. I can't remember the date. I can't remember the day. I can't remember the hour. Where does it say that that's a requirement to be saved? All I know is that I met Christ. My life changed. I know I'm saved, but people want to add that to it. Or maybe they want to add, like I said last week, they want to add some people would say if the preacher wasn't using the King James Bible when you were saved, then you're not saved. He has to be using the King James Bible. Is that crazy that someone would say something like that? But that's adding to as much as they're adding right here. If you're not circumcised, you're not saved. People needed to be preaching the Bible when you were saved, but not a particular translation. It's just not, I don't understand that. But it gets even crazier. I know there's a lot of other things that come out that people say you need to do this, you need to do that to be saved. I remember we, uh, my first pastorate, I was pastoring in Jennings, and there was a couple that was coming over from another church visiting our church. And uh, they finally said, we want to talk to you about becoming part of your church. It's a very important question we have to ask you. And I said, sure, let's set up a meeting and we'll do that. And so uh, I said, well, well, uh, what's the problem? Are you saved? They said, oh, yeah, we're saved. We don't have any question about that. They, they, they knew about that. I said, well, what's, what's the deal? Well, we don't know if we can come here because if we do, we fear for our child's life. I said, what? Is someone threatening you here? This? What's the matter with that? Well, the pastor at the church told us that our son was dedicated at that church. And if we ever left that church, then that child's life could be in danger. And I said, you need to get away from that church as fast as you can get away from that church, because that's nowhere in Scripture. People are being bound, fettered with things that people are making up to control people's lives. They're saying things that they shouldn't say. As much as we had a problem in, in 1517, we have problems like that today. People are putting things on people and binding, bonding, and putting them back in bondage with things that you need to just understand. That's not part of it. How are you saved? By grace, through faith in Jesus, by having a conviction of your need of his offer of the finished works through crucifixion, resurrection, and you need to receive that by grace through faith and call out to Christ and repent of your sins, acknowledge the negative, and receive the positive. And when you do that by grace through faith, you are saved. Don't let anyone do this right here and put something else on you. So once you're saved, as I said, you begin to grow. You begin to learn. Your testimony becomes something that people see and want to hear from you how they might be saved. 
And let me just say one other thing. When I, when I mention that you should begin to pray for people to be saved, and that may be as far as it goes for you right now until you grow in your faith, all of your life as a Christian is about what? Loving people. Loving God first, but people second. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. First commandment, that's to you as a Christian. Love your neighbor as yourself, that's to you as a Christian. It's loving people. This is how you know you're saved. You begin to love people, and you want to see people saved, even the people you have not liked to that point, maybe. It's all about learning, because the Scripture is going to continue to come to you. It's about learning. It's about being nourished, about being fed. We come to the Word of God. We come here to receive it. I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to. I don't have to do things to get you to come to church. I don't have to jump through hoops. We don't have to have clowns in the parking lot. You know why? Because God's people are hungry for the Word. It's an evidence of salvation. You love people. You long for people to be saved. You learn the scripture. You want to learn the scripture. It nourishes you. It feeds you. And what you learn, you want to live. This is evidence of salvation. You want to live. And this is what's happening in Acts chapter 2. And I know you're familiar with it, so we're not going to go there. But in Acts chapter 2, what's happened is after three years of learning under Jesus, these disciples who are now saved and filled with the Spirit show something through their life that people can't ignore They come together to see it, to hear about it, tell me more. And when Peter preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, 3,000 people say, I have a desire to have what you have. What do I do? See, it's how it works. So where are we? As Christians today, we have every reason to have all confidence in our salvation because that confidence is our faith in Christ. We have every reason to want other people to have the same, love them. We continue to learn and show them what we're learning. And this is all about more evidence of our salvation. But let me close with this, because I think people, many times when I share with people, you need to share with others. They say, well, I'm not really a good spokesperson. Not really good at telling people. In in Acts, again, We have uh, the disciples who realized rather soon that there was going to be some persecution for being faithful to presenting the gospel. I'm going to show you a film Sunday. This is just going to be a three or four minute film Sunday about the persecuted church. If you think persecution was just locked in the first few centuries of the church history, you're wrong. We have brothers and sisters all over this world who are being killed because of one reason. They know Jesus, that's all. But the church in the book of Acts, as I said, we should desire to share, tell people, realize that sharing and telling people immediately brought about the arrest of Peter and John. They went to prison. They went to jail. Church got together and prayed, and God delivered them. But do you know what the church prayed for next after they prayed for the deliverance of Peter and John from jail? The Bible says, in being let go, Peter and John went to their companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders said to them. When they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are the God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Who By the mouth of your servant David said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers had gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now look on their threats and listen to the request and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. 
Scripture, Scripture. What did they want most of all? They didn't say, God, keep us from going to prison. Don't let us go to prison. Don't let us be persecuted. No, they prayed for boldness to preach the word of God. And while you may desire to share, you may be hesitant as much as the church was in the early days. But let their prayer be an encouragement to you. For the Bible says, by stretching out your hand to heal and signs and wonders may be done through your name or the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word with boldness. You just need boldness. You just need to be filled with the Spirit. You just need to pray and say, God, I know that this is going to cost me something I expected to to live for you. But I don't want to live with doubt and fear and worry. I want to live with faith, joy, blessing. So fill me with your Spirit and help me to stand up and say what needs to be said because that's why I was saved and left here to speak your word, which when people hear, Some will believe, and when they believe, they will call, and when they call, they will be saved. And that's what it's all about. So are you saved? Sure, if you can relate to all that we've gone through tonight, just the Word of God, it just keeps showing up on the page, showing up on the page. Speak the Word. Tell what God's done in your life. Share the gospel with people. Be a witness. Teach those who are saved the Word of God. Continue because they have to continue to live by faith once they're saved by faith. Just speak the word of God. Get to the point where it just flows out of you freely. And pray God to fill you with the spirit and give you the bold to speak. Next week, I'm going to be speaking on the testimony of the apostles concerning salvation. Some of the terms that they used that would be used interchangeable with salvation. Phrases are words. And that gives us a different view As we look at salvation, what does the word of God say about salvation? So, Father, we thank you for bringing us together to encourage us. We do have a desire that our friends, our relatives and our neighbors would come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And, Father, we pray that the stumbling blocks that are in their way, Lord, that you would deal with those things. Give us an open door of opportunity to share with them. And when we share, may we share with a loving heart. And with a bold heart, may we share the word because we know it is vital. Your word is is vital to the hearing of those who need to be saved. May we be faithful to share. And Father, I just thank you that you can put it in all of our hearts to say salvation is of the Lord. May we be faithful to share that message with others. Thank you for the confidence and assurance we have received even tonight to know that we are yours, and we praise you for this. Now bless us in this week to continue to live for your glory. Give us opportunities where we go, and guide us where we go for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Loving Christ, the media ministry of New Covenant Church of Denham Springs, Louisiana. If we can minister to you somehow, please call us at area code 225-664-0858. Until next time, get into the Word of God and stay there. This has been a production of New Covenant Church, all rights reserved.